Hey, Mabel, Pastor Bill here with your Maple Minute. Just want to take a moment to remind you, Monday, April 6th, the next Monday coming up, uh, Randolph County Commissioners have asked us to make it a day of prayer. And so we at Maple, we're taking it one step further. We'd like for you to not just make it a day of prayer, but make it a day of prayer and fasting. God's the only hope we have to change things uh, for us, and he is all-powerful. He's greater than this pandemic. So if we want relief, what we need to do is seek God's face. And so uh, that's a biblical pro uh, promise. And so we're asking that you not just pray, but if you can, uh, step it up one notch by prayer and fasting. And that's a great thing to do. Um, and we want to do it for the entire day. It, it just uh, as long as you, want, you can do it, please take the time to pray and fast. Let me challenge you with just a couple of words of encouragement, uh, something to, to help you, uh, something that God sh shared with me and that I want to share with you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a pastor during the time of the, uh, the World War II and the Nazis, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said uh, this, Your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their belief in God. And I think that is so important. Here's a guy that really knew what it was like to live in some difficult times. But we as Christians, we should live in such a way that it makes a difference. And that's really the bottom line, and that's probably nothing you've heard that's new. But at the end of the day, let me just reinforce this. At the end of the day, it isn't what Christians say, but rather how we live that communicates eternal principles to a non-believing culture. So many people I know now are out protesting different things that the government's doing. By the way, don't forget, as I always say, sin or sin. So don't be surprised when the government or non-Christians do something that is contrary to what we as Christians would do. But, let me just say this too, on the other side, at the end of the day, it isn't what we say, it's how we live that communicates the eternal principles, and, and that's one of the problems we've had. See, boycotts don't work. Petitions don't work. Political ca campaigns, they don't work. They don't change our country. And I think for too long, Christians have done what we shouldn't do, done contrary to what, we, we've got to get back to what Jesus is doing. For too long, Christians have sought out influence and power Instead of seeking out what Jesus did, he sought to love the one another and, and to serve one another. And that's what Jesus did. You think about it, all the instances in the, the New Testament and the Gospels where Jesus interacted with people, uh, other than the, the religious people, isn't it amazing? Those are the people that he had a hard time being around, but he always found ways to serve them. Uh, he found ways to serve women, uh, a woman at a well in Samaria who was so marginalized, even her own people didn't really spend a lot of time with her. She had a rough life. He, he took the time to help the woman who was caught in the middle of adult, uh, the act of adultery. He, he took the time to serve and to love people. And, and, and so that, that's brought me that question that I've been running through my mind, and I've been reading, uh, reading some things uh, historically about the very first church there in, in the first century, and, and what these early Christians did that was so mind-blowing is that they did what Jesus did. They loved and served like Jesus Christ. They loved and served other people. They didn't think about themselves. They didn't think about their political stances. They didn't think about uh, protecting their rights because they didn't, they realized they're not of this earth. They turned their world upside down because they wanted, went out and they loved others. They pick, picked up babies who were unwanted off the garbage piles. They didn't, they didn't petition the government. They didn't get out and do protests. They did the right thing. And what would it look like if we live lives that so baffled our culture that we would force people to rethink what they thought about Jesus Christ? See, in the world's eyes, they don't think much of Christians because they don't think much of Jesus Christ because of the way we've portrayed him. We've portrayed him as a God who's against everything. Uh, I think it was D.L. Moody who said this, and this is a good, good statement. Lighthouses blow no horns. They just shine. And that, that's really, he's got it right, because, uh, and, and I know some people would, would uh, scoff at it, I didn't say we shouldn't speak the truth, but we should do it in love, the way the Bible tells us to. We don't have to make a nuisance of ourselves, we just need to do what God has, has said. Uh, I came across this verse to reinforce what I'm saying, and this is a verse I want you to hang on to. Romans chapter 15, verse 13, near the end of the letter, Paul writes this. He says, and listen so carefully, there's so much in this, he says, May the God of hope, our God's a God of hope. He says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may 
overflow, overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I, just so many great things in that. First of all, he is, our God is a God of hope, and I've already mentioned that. But he wants to give you all joy and peace. And I think those are two things that we need in this time period of pandemic. There's so much uh, fear, so much anxiety, that joy and peace are really the opposites of them when you think about it. But you don't get it unless you trust in him, is what Paul says. As you trust in him, the God of hope gives you all joy and peace. That's so clear. And so i got to think, if we're swimming in our fears, if we're swimming in anxiety, if we're swimming in all these problems, then what we have to do is turn our minds and our hearts back to God and put our trust and hope in him. It's a faith matter. And it always comes down to this, doesn't it? And then he says, it's not just for you and your, your problems and your, your difficulties. He says, so that you may, and I love this, overflow. He doesn't say just be full. In fact, that's, it reminds me of John 10.10 10, where Jesus says that he came to give us life, and not just life, but an overabundant life, a, a life that's just overly brimming with what? Joy and hope and peace. That's what Jesus came to do, and that's what Paul's reminding the church there in Rome. And he's reminding us. He says, you need to overflow with what? With hope. The world around you has no hope. But you can only do it, and he makes sure we're we're understanding this isn't something you can create on your own. He says, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We've got to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit, not on our own. We've got to overflow with hope, the hope that comes from God, that comes from the comforter, the, 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 the resource that we have in our life. See, in many ways, the greatest single difference between believers and non-believers, between Christians and non-Christians, should be the presence of joy in their life. See, even in the midst of difficult circumstances, Christians should be joyful, and when that happens, culture will notice, people will notice, your neighbors will notice. And and we we want to also reinforce this fact, too, that it's not just uh, happiness. It's not fun. Joy isn't just mere fun. I'm having a good time. Because there are going to be times, I know some of you are dealing with some pretty rough situations. I think about Johnny and Lisa Maxey. Uh, if you haven't been paying attention, Lisa's mom's not doing well. And that's a real rough time. I know there's others of you that you have uh, relatives, moms, I think of, of uh, Miss Judy. Her, her, her mom's in a nursing home and she can't even go see her. And those are tough times. And and so I'm not saying, hey, it's all about the fun times. It's not even about happiness. It's not being happy all the time. It's a deep inner peace and joy that comes from a hope of knowing God's in control. Pastor's wife and author, Kay Warren, she said it this way. And and this is just such a great statement. uh, And she breaks it down to three things. But she says, joy is settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life. The quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right, and the determined choice to praise God in all things. Let me go back and and break that down. She says three things. She says, first of all, what is joy? It's the settled assurance that God is control of all the details of my life. Hey, you need to get that settled in your life. Is God Lord? Is he really in control? I'm not asking you today if you, you got saved. I'm asking today if you've actually put God on the throne or are you still trying to figure things out? You may say, hey, pastor, you don't understand. My, my pay has been cut. I don't have a job now. I'm, I, hey, by the way, if you're in deep need, you need to call us and let us know so we can help you. But I want you to know, joy is not about, <clears throat> about hey, I got in my way. Joy is about the settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life. I've rest a lot better when I know that God has my back, that God has, and he has all the details, even the smallest little things. He's got it all. Number two, she said, joy is the quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right. I'm not promising today that you're, you're going to be financially better off after this. I'm not going to promise you today that you've got, got health beyond measure. I'm not going to promise you that nothing is going to be affected. What I'm going to promise you is that no matter what happens, everything is going to be all right. How do I know that? Because God is still on the throne of the universe. God is still there, and I think that's so important. It's a quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right. Hey, you know what? I watch the news and I hear the numbers and I think, wow, a world, there are people that entered eternity that probably weren't prepared for that. What a shame. But I have the quiet confidence that everything's going to be right in my life. And and that's the hope we have to share with other people. And then number three, she says, it's the determined choice. And it is a choice to praise God in all things. Hey, you know what? We can praise God even for this pandemic. I think 
that it really has brought us into more of a focus as Christians about our faith. I think it's a time that we, we've been able to actually talk to people about what we believe if we want to. And I think this is a, we have to make it, a, as Kay Warren said, a determined choice to praise God in all things. He didn't, I, I, the Bible says give thanks uh, in all things, but not for all things. I, I don't think you have to be thankful for this pandemic, but you can thank God in this pandemic. You can thank God in the bad situations of life. You can thank God during the difficult times. So once again, Romans 15, verse 13, let me leave you with this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow. Don't keep it to yourself. Let your friends, your neighbors know that you can overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe it would be good for you to take the time to memorize this verse. I'm going to. Put it in memory, and then you can repeat it the next time you get into a fearful situation, the next time that you're worried about things, the next time you hear bad news, which is probably going to be in a couple minutes when they have another pr press conference or, or news. Things are not good, but God is. So put your hope and your trust in him. Well, until next time, we'll see you and, and keep trusting in God. Pray for one another. Reach out to your community and do some great things for God in his name. Let's just not talk about it. Let's live it. Live the love life. See you then, Maple.